Now we'll take uh, leaders' questions. Understanding Order 29, Deputy Martin, please. Um, if I may, just before I commence, just join with the Taoiseach in offering our sympathies to the French people uh, on the appalling and endless fire that destroyed the Notre uh, Dame Cathedral uh, last evening. It belongs to the French people, but in many ways it belongs to the world. And uh, many of us experienced the joy of visiting it. Uh, and I think our sympathies and support go to the, the French people. Uh, such a wonderful historical um, uh, iconic uh, piece of architecture. Taoiseach, um, in recent weeks the country has been dismayed by the unfolding saga at the Football Association of Ireland. Thousands of our people at all ages participate uh, in FEI sports and soccer, uh, at school boys, uh, school girls, right through to senior uh, and, and adult level. And they participate in organising, mentoring, volunteering, uh, and in celebrating uh, the game of football. Many people at ground level now are extremely angry at the current state of affairs. And last week's appearance before the Oireachtas Committee uh, by the FAI uh, was both farcical at one level, but also effective at another level. Uh, because whilst there was much obfuscation and a straightforward refusal to be open with the committee, um, the Court of Public Opinion didn't take too kindly uh, to that. Uh, and what they saw in operation essentially was that the Irish people, through their public representatives, were being denied an open, straightforward explanation in relation to the specific matter of a €100,000 loan to the association by the former Chief Executive Officer. But of course, wider issues of governance and um, capacity within the FAI emerged from, that, from the revelation around that one uh, transaction, uh, transaction. Essentially, in refusing to be open with the committee, the FAI and the former CEO were refusing to be open with the Irish people. The state support of soccer is substantial. I think it was over 50 million in the last decade, and rightly so. Sorry, and that support has been withdrawn, and I think that's right. Uh, and I think the lack of um, the, the, that support can only be restored uh, when we have full proper corporate governance. But also, critically, I would say at this stage, Taoiseach, given the impact and the, so many people depending uh, on the proper effective running of the organisation, uh, on the commissioning by the Department of Sport through Sports Ireland of a truly independent uh, forensic um, audit of the finances of the Football Association of Ireland. Until that happens, the funding cannot be restored. We had the Genesis report well over uh, a decade ago. Its recommendations were not followed through, and questions remain as to why th those recommendations were not followed through. But this is now an opportunity to clean up once and for all and to give, to give full transparency um, to the affairs of the association. We've learned at lunchtime that Deloitte have submitted a H4 form to the, o to, to the CRO, uh, which, which saying that the FAI has been in breach of sections 281 and 282 of the Companies Act. The implications are that transactions may have occurred uh, that were not brought to the attention of the auditors or of which they had no knowledge. Corporate governance expert Neve Brennan has said at lunchtime it doesn't get any more serious than that. Uh, failing to keep proper accounting records is indeed Thank you, Deputy very Deputy serious. So Taoiseach, I would ask that the government uh, would ensure that such a forensic audit of the FI finances would be organised uh, and also uh, that the opportunity is taken to ensure uh, restoration of proper corporate governments uh, and a new era for the Football Association arising out of this sorry saga. Thank you, Deputy Martin. Taoiseach. Uh, thanks, Deputy. And thank you, Ken Corla. Um, I also want to offer uh, my sympathies to the people of Paris and of France, uh, and indeed to uh, all Catholics around the world uh, following the devastating fire which destroyed Notre Dame Cathedral yesterday. For almost 700 years, the iconic cathedral has survived war, uh, has survived rebellions and revolutions, uh, and it will survive this. But the Irish people and the wider Catholic community are heartbroken uh, at the events of yesterday. In this Holy Week, when we look for hope in the story of resurrection and an answer to millions of prayers that have been said, and as President Macron has said today, Notre Dame is part of the destiny of France and will, I'm sure, be reborn and rebuilt. In relation to FAI and the Football Association of Ireland, I want to say that the government very much shares the concern of taxpayers, the anger of football fans uh, and the annoyance of the football grassroots. 
uh, on the revelations of how FAI has been run in recent years, if not for much longer. The FAI isn't a public body, uh, and it's not a government agency, and its staff are not public servants. About 5% of its funding comes from government agencies, and almost all that funding goes to very worthwhile programmes, youth in sport, women in sport, sports capital grants for local clubs around the country, uh, and also some funding for uh, the Euro 2020 Games, which are due to be held in the Aviva next year, which I know uh, so many of us are looking forward to. And government wants that to continue, because it is our role to fund youth in sport, fund participation, fund women's sports, help fund local clubs around the country, uh, and also support major tournaments. But we can't do that until the uh, accountants, accounting problems and financial regular, regularities and corporate governance problems uh, in the FAI are put right. Uh, this was discussed uh, at Cabinet this morning, and I know the Joint Directors Committee uh, on Transport, Tourism and Sport uh, is holding hearings today. I agree that investigations are necessary, uh, investigations uh, by Sport Ireland uh, into uh, the accounts and the finances of FAI, uh, and also it may be necessary for the ODCE um, to carry out an investigation uh, under company law uh, if there have been breaches uh, of company law. Uh, so those investigations need to take place. Um, I think it's probably best for Sport Ireland and ODC to decide the form of those investigations, uh, but I agree that those investigations are required. And the objective must be uh, to restore confidence uh, in how FAI is being run, uh, making sure that we can get back to doing what we should be doing, uh, which is promoting this sport, uh, funding it, at grassroots level for participation by young people and women in particular uh, and making sure that this really popular sport across the country um, is able to focus on what it does best. Thank you, Taoiseach. Deputy Martin. You didn't sit down, so just the one question I put to you about the need to commission an independent, uh, robust for un forensic analysis, uh, audit sorry, of, the, of the finances of the FEI, um, because it's been too much cloud, clouded in obfuscation to date. We just simply haven't been told anything as to why such a loan was necessitated. Are, for example, what's the debt in relation to the Aviva? Um, how is the FEI performing relative to the RFU in relation to that? Um, I accept your point that it's not a public body. Nonetheless, um, the state has invested very heavily. I would suggest the Aviva could not have happened without the state's involvement. And many stadia around the country couldn't have happened. I know in Turner Scrofs, the Munster Football Association, the funding came, a lot of it through the state. Um, so the point I'm putting to you that Sports Ireland is in a strong position. And I don't think anyone can object to the idea of an independent forensic audit. Why? Just to find out what are, what, what, because we're hearing rumours all over the place. What is the state of the FAI's finances today? Uh, that is important. Uh, and that there would be total transparency um, in relation to that. We regulate charities, we regulate groups all over the country. And I think that there's a public expectation that when substantial state funds are allocated, that things would be above board you, Deputy, in relation to all of those basic requirements around corporate governance, transparency around the financial position of a company. And the news today that the, uh, you know, the, the auditors have referred and submitted a H4 form is very, very worrying and suggests that Time something is, up, is deeply wrong here. And the only way I would suggest you can clear it up is by such an audit. Taoiseach. Uh, thanks, Deputy. I, I think we're broadly in agreement on this matter. Um, I absolutely agree that uh, Sport Ireland needs to carry out an investigation uh, in the form of a robust independent audit of the finances of FAI in recent years. Um, the term forensic has two meanings, as you know. Uh, forensic can mean in depth, in, in detail, and if that's what you mean, I agree. Forensic can also have a legal meaning, which relates to criminality and criminal prosecution. Uh, and, FA, and Sport Ireland does not have the authority to uh, carry out criminal investigations or recommend prosecutions and could actually prejudice a prosecution by carrying out a forensic order of that nature. But um, if by forensic you mean in depth and detail, I agree. Deputy Mary Lou MacDonald, please. Gormagat Cian Corla and. Uh the world looked on with uh, horror at the inferno at uh, Notre Dame Cathedral. And can I, uh, along with colleagues, extend uh, our sympathies to the people of Paris in particular, um, but to everybody who, who visited uh, and who loved that great cathedral. And I have no doubt uh, that it will be rebuilt. So, Gormaya Gut Akhaun Korla Tishuk. Uh, last December, you said that the cost 
of the national broadband uh, rollout plan could amount to many multiples of what was originally estimated. And that's a view that you reiterated again in recent weeks. So we are now faced, perhaps, again, with the scandalous, scandalous cost overrun that might be commensurate with the debacle around the National Children's Hospital. A scenario, again, where a vital piece of infrastructure desperately needed in much of rural Ireland goes way over budget and left at the mercy of one investor. I don't think that this is an accidental or an incidental occurrence at Taoiseach, because once again all of this is the result of a botched tendering process. The completion of, the rollout was of this process was targeted for June 2017, but it's still ongoing now, some two years later. There's now just one bidder remaining for the contract, leaving the government and in turn the taxpayer in an extremely precarious position. The original estimated cost uh, for the plan was to be some 500 million euro. And now we, are, we hear or we are advised that it could in fact run into billions rather than hundreds of millions of euros. Should this transpire, Taoiseach, it is a damning indictment of your party's management or mismanagement of the public finances. And we need, therefore, to get to the bottom of what is happening here. You said to us in February that you wanted to be transparent on these matters and that you would consult with the Oireachtas on this matter, but that never happened. So can I ask, when exactly will we have clarity on the cost of the national broadband rollout? This was supposed to be announced before Easter. Minister Bruton now says that it's not going to happen despite your repeated assurances that it would. And the real casualty of this entire debacle, Taoiseach, is the over half a million homes that are still without access to broadband. Seven years after this plan was originally announced, we still don't have a date for commencement and the commitment to deliver high-speed broadband to every home and business by 2020 is going to be broken spectacularly. The process has been chaotic and, quite frankly, farcical. When, Taoiseach, will we have clarity as to when people will actually get access to high-speed broadband? There's been an adherence to a specific model for the broad broadband plan, where the project will be conducted by a private company Thank and you, ownership you. will revert to the private company <clears throat> after 25 years. And you're now tied, as I say, to one bidder. They have the bargaining Taoiseach now, not the state. So if this, if this process fails or you decide to ditch this process, tell me what's plan B. Leaving households and businesses I and communities in the lurch is not a policy option here, Taoiseach. Taoiseach. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Ken Corla and Deputy, for your question. As I've always said about this project and other projects, small and large, you only really know what the true cost of it's going to be when the bids and when the tenders come in. Uh, and when it comes to this project, uh, there were three bids. Uh, it is true that two of those three bidders have since withdrawn, but we do have three bids and we do know what the cost of this project is. And all of those three bids uh, have come in uh, at a similar figure. Um, when you refer to the original cost uh, of 500 million euros, that original cost estimate, what you neglected to mention is that original cost estimate was for a very different project. Uh, that was a project designed to bring fibre to 11,000 villages, to bring fibre to the towns and villages of Ireland, but not to the rural areas. So I think when people talk about uh, the cost having uh, or being multiples of, um, uh, of that original cost, it's important to point out on every occasion that it's a different project. Bringing fibre to the villages of Ireland is not the same uh, as bringing fibre to 540,000 homes and farms and businesses in rural Ireland. So it is uh, quite a different project. Uh, since this government came to office, made up of uh, Fine Gael and the Independents, we've seen a major increase in the number of homes uh, that have access to high-speed broadband. It was about 50% three years ago. It's now over 75% today. But that still means that without government intervention, about 540,000 homes, farms and businesses will not have access to high-speed broadband. And that's why government intervention is required, in my view. It's not a small number of people. 
It's not a small number of homes. It's 540,000 homes and farms and businesses, over a million people, and will require the laying of 100,000 kilometres of fibre, which is a huge project when you look at it in, in that way. The government needs to spend a little bit more time uh, before we can bring a decision to, to Cabinet uh, on this. Um, as you know, the cost, uh, including VAT, contingencies and so on, uh, could be in the region uh, of €3 billion, Euros, uh, albeit spread over 25 years. But again, bear in mind the benefits. 540,000 homes and farms and businesses, over a million people. Uh, a huge project um, of huge scale. Um, but we want to do this, and we want to do it right. And before we can bring a decision to Cabinet, we want to make sure that there is no better alternative. You asked about Plan B, or Plan C, or Plan D. We're examining all of those, because we want to convince ourselves uh, that the cost and the business case and all of these things are deliverable, that it's done in accordance with the public spending code, that it's been technically reviewed, that international expertise and an outside panel has examined this, uh, and that all of the alternative ideas being floated by people um, are not better, that it can't be done uh, cheaper or quicker. And we want to satisfy ourselves of all of those things, make a cabinet decision, uh, and then bring it before the Joint Directors Committee and the Dáil for them to examine the facts as well. Thank you, Taoiseach. Deputy Mary Lou McConnell. Well, Taoiseach, you say that you, that you want more time. But uh, by way of response to a parliamentary question to my colleague, uh, Chuck de Stanley, uh, we know that for over two years, 80 civil servants and consultants have been working on this tender process. We know that this whole process has been marked by delay. We know that that has generated massive frustration and impatience right across, right across uh, those rural homes and communities that you describe. And now you say you need more time. You've challenged me on, on using the terminology multiples of the 500 million. That's the, that's the phrase that you used yourself, Taoiseach. You said that it would likely cost multiples. So that's your language, not mine. What we want to know now is what is the final cost. And it's an astonishing thing, you know, that the head of government would take such a laissez-faire approach to final costings. I mean, you should have a view as to the affordability or the price range uh, of the state. And yet, it's very, in a very similar manner to your colleague, Minister Simon Harris, in relation to a hospital, a hospital that will prove perhaps to be the most expensive hospital ever built anywhere in the world, you persist with this laissez-faire approach. So I've asked two questions, uh, Count Corla. I'd like an answer to them. I actually asked three. Number one, Quite the nice. issue of course. Number two, the issue of timing. And number three, what is the plan B if all else fails? We've offered you a plan B by way of using the ESB network, an established uh, network Deputy such please, as that. You've resisted that thus far. Will you consider it if it comes to it? Taoiseach, please. At, um, Deputy, I really think you need to pull out your Irish French dictionary and look up what the word laissez-faire means. There's nothing laissez-faire about this at all. Uh, we're, we're going into this one. In, in, we're, we're going into this one. We're going to this one into uh, in excruciating detail. Um, you're, you're right. Um, those are my words. Uh, the final cost of this uh, will be uh, will be a multiple of the original estimate. But what you would never mention is the full truth. And there's a difference between the truth and the whole truth. This is a different project. The original estimate was based. The original estimate was, the estimate was based on bringing fibre to 11,000 villages, not fibre to 400 and, 540,000 homes, farms, and businesses and businesses in, in Ireland. And if we look at the scale, if we look at the scale, if we look at the scale of this project, Count Corla, we're talking half a million homes, farms, and businesses. We're talking that, that benefits for over a million people. We're talking about a project of the scale of rural, rural electrification, which took 20 or 30 years, and this will not take this long. We're looking at a project of the cost and scale of Ardna Crusha. And in relation to Plan B, yes, of course we're looking at other options. I said that earlier, Plan B, Plan C, Plan D. The problem with the Sinn Féin plan uh, is, of course, it's been considered. First of all, ESB pulled out. It would cost more. Uh, and, uh, and, and because of rules around state aid and procurement, you couldn't just award it to a semi-state. You would have to put it out to tender. So the Sinn Féin alternative, 
they pulled out, it would cost more, it would take longer. Thank you, Taoiseach. Deputy Brendan Howland, please. Please. We have order for Deputy Howland, please, now. Can I, firstly, on my own behalf and behalf of the Labour Party, express my support and solidarity for the people of Paris and of France on the devastating fire at Notre Dame de Paris last night, uh, a World Heritage Site that hopefully can be fully restored. Uh, Kyonkorlo, over the last few weeks, women from across Ireland have been telling their stories on Joe Duffy's live line about their experiences of our maternity services. There is an urgent need to improve our maternity hospitals. Last year, we saw months of delay in beginning work on moving the National Maternity Hospital to its new site at St Vincent's. Well, Hollow Street has and continues to deliver excellent care to mothers and to babies, international best practice is for maternity hospitals to be situated on the same campus as an acute hospital for all the necessary consultants and specialist care to be provided on site. That delay is regrettable. This year, the government has confirmed that the plan for the National Children's Hospital involves the co-location of the Coombe Maternity Hospital, which is to be moved uh, from its current location in Cork Street. The tri-location with St James's would provide best international practice. The Minister for Health, however, has confirmed in recent days that there is no funding this year to start the work on moving the Coombe to the James's site. Earlier this year, I, I asked the Minister to confirm that there's actually sufficient space on the James, Street, uh, James uh, site for a new maternity hospital. According to the newspapers, uh, there is a three-acre site put aside. You might indicate exactly where this is, because people have asked have found difficulty in identifying it. The Minister has indicated that he would be spending money this year on theatres in the Coombe, in lieu of moving the Coombe. To what extent will this investment be transferable once the new hospital is built? Is this investment in the Coombe an indication that we're going to remain at the Coombe site for years to come. So my questions, Count uh, Corla, can the government give us a very clear timeline, firstly, for the delivery of the new maternity hospital at St, the new National Maternity Hospital at St Vincent's? When do you envisage that that will be completed and open? Secondly, can you, can you give me a timeline for the moving of the Coombe Maternity Hospital to the tri-located site at James's and confirm that there is space for it there. And finally, the timeline for the delivery and relocation of Limerick's new maternity hospital, which by everybody's understanding is also urgently needed. Thank you, Deputy Howland. Taoiseach. Um, thanks very much, uh, uh, Deputy. Um, You'll know that probably for, I think, for the best part of 20 years in Ireland, no new hospitals were built, or uh, arguably one hospital was built. We're now in a very different space today, uh, where we have three, three hospitals under construction at the moment in Ireland. The National Children's Hospital, the National Forensic Mental Health Hospital in Port Tran, uh, and also uh, the new National Rehab Hospital in Dunleary. So after a very long time of no, no new hospitals being built in Ireland, we now have three... Well, apart from, C apart from CMH, which other hospital was built in the last 20 years? That's 20 years ago. It's not, it's not far off 20 years anyway. And Tala was, was 1999. But, um, um, yeah. but I'd happy... Order. Please. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can we just hear the response? I, I'm, Can we hear the response? Count Corla... Um, Count Corl, I'm, I'm, I'm often accused of spin, but if people think a new ward or a new wing is a new hospital, you know they're the ones who need, 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 to, need, to, consi need to consider these things. Um, to answer the question, Count Corla, um, maternity, maternity services in Ireland are very good. Uh, we see that in terms of patient outcomes uh, of, at all levels, uh, and the staff in our maternity services, midwives, nurses, obstetricians and others, do a fabulous job in my view. We have roughly 60,000 births in Ireland every year, um, and of course, uh, while services are very good, there will always be people who had an unsatisfactory or bad experience. And it's important that we listen to those stories, learn from them, and see what we can improve. 
Uh, and for the last two years, we've been doing a patient experience survey, asking patients to judge our health service. 83% of them say that they had a good, very good uh, or excellent experience. We now need to extend that to maternity services as well. Uh, in terms of the National Maternity Strategy, National Maternity Strategy provides for the co-location and relocation of four maternity hospitals, Hollis Street uh, to the St. Vincent's campus, St. Munchens and Limerick to the Dora Doyle campus, the Coombe to the St. James's campus, and the site is designated uh, for that, involves demolishing outpatients and other things, but the site is designated for that and has been for quite some time, uh, and the Rotunda to, and Rotunda to Blanchardstown. They can't all be done at the same time. We're building three hospitals at the moment, there's only so many hospitals you can build at the one time. So the first one is, is Hollis Street, uh, to move to St. Vincent's, has planning permission already. Some necessary works are underway on the St. Vincent's campus to move the pharmacy and make space for the new hospital. Anticipate that going to tender this year, uh, and uh, I'd expect going to construction next year. Then the others have to move into the, into the tendering and planning and design process, and that hasn't started yet. Uh, and each one will have to be done one by one. And it would be wrong for me now to put a timeline on those things and not be able to stand over it. First one is Hall Street, planning permission done, tenders up next, then we'll go to construction, then with the other three we'll have to do the same. Design, planning, tender, construction. And given what I've learned from major capital projects, I'm not going to put a timeline on it now uh, that isn't Thank necessarily you, one that I can stand over. Deputy Howland. Um, the Taoiseach is right. Uh, we are fortunate to have an extraordinary um, people working in maternity uh, services in this country. Uh, but they're working in very adverse conditions often. Uh, the HSC has this afternoon apologised uh, to those women whose experience were outlined on the Joe Duffy programme, uh, recognition of uh, shortcomings. And those shortcomings need to be met by the proper resources. You've indicated that Hollow Street is to happen. Hollow Street was announced by Minister James Riley. I allocated the money myself as Minister for Public Expenditure for that to happen. And it still hasn't happened. That's nearly five years ago. But the most urgent issue now is we're, we're building a state-of-the-art children's hospital. It's to be a tri-located hospital. But you're giving no indication when the Coombe will move to that tri-located site. You have an opening date for a new children's hospital, but the whole idea of it was to have it uh, close to a maternity hospital where the most vulnerable babies uh, could have instant access to the best children's hospital facilities. Thank you, Deputy. And you can't even give us an indication. I'm using my 24 seconds of, uh, that I kept from the last yes. bit. Um, you, you, you might indicate, do you agree with me that it is urgent if the vision for the, look, for the determination that James's was the appropriate site, to have three hospitals built, and one of them can't be put into abeyance. See an idea. Thank you. Please, I think, um, I, I think, Deputy, to your credit, you did allocate funding um, for uh, the relocation of the new, um, or the relocation of the National Maternity Hospital St. Vincent's new allocated, I think, a sum of 50 million for the Coombe and the Rotunda, but as we all know, uh, allocating a sum is not the same as allocating uh, the amount of money that's going to be required to do these projects, and we won't know that uh, until, the tenders, uh, until the tenders come in and the planning and design and everything else is done. Uh, and one of the things that we're changing about public procurement is that we won't decide to go ahead with any major capital project now uh, until the tenders actually come in. Uh, and that is a change, um, but, I think it's a, um, but I think it's a change for, for the better. But it's not correct to claim credit for having allocated the money for something before you actually knew, before you actually knew um, what, what it's going to cost. What, what I'm saying, and, and everyone, everyone agreed with this three years ago, is that we wouldn't sign off on major capital projects until the tenders come in and we actually know the price. And that applies, that applies, that applies to all projects, Ken Corla, uh, of, all, of all nature, and appears to be a sensible policy uh, in my view. Um, I, I'd be delighted to answer these questions, but it's, I'm not... You're not thinking about it. Okay. Please. The, 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 the policy is and has been for a very long time to try locate uh, the National Children's Hospital with the Maternity Hospital at an adult hospital. Seven years ago, it was decided to do that at the St. James's site, largely for medical and clinical reasons, not reasons based to cost or planning. Uh, the Children's Hospital is now under construction. It'll be finished in 2022. It'll be commissioned in 2023. You, uh, and time. we'll need to start planning and design for the Coombe to move to the adjacent site before that. Deputy Richard Boyd Barrett. Following the publication of the Social Justice 
Ireland uh, report yesterday. Do you feel ashamed, and does your government feel ashamed, of the fact that 760,000 <coughs> of our citizens are living in poverty, uh, and a quarter of a million of those, or just under, are children living in poverty. This is in one of the richest countries in the world, and in a country where you keep telling us, reminding us, that we have nearly full employment. Uh, indeed, a huge cohort of those living in poverty are working, the working poor uh, and their children. Uh, to my mind, Taoiseach, this is utterly uh, shameful. There are many contributory factors to this obscene level of poverty. Low pay, precarious work, the extortionate cost of childcare. But there is no doubt that probably the major contributory factor at the moment is the obscene and unaffordable cost of housing and of rent. Housing, average, costs nine times uh, the average income. Rents in Dublin for a three-bedroom home now an astonishing average of €3,400 uh, a month. Now, I just want to give you two instances of where your policies are directly contributing, your housing policies and the failure of them are contributing to driving people into poverty. Many working people in this country whose incomes are slightly over the income threshold for so social housing uh, are completely abandoned by your government uh, in terms of uh, housing uh, support. Uh, one recent report shows 20% of households are paying over 40% of their income uh, on rent, and 10% are paying an incredible 60% of their income on rent, and most of them are getting no support from your government you won't raise the social housing uh, income thr thresholds to give them so, uh, social housing support, and you provide no affordable housing. And then there's another cohort, those who are HAP tenants. I was shocked to discover, Count Corley, in a question uh, to Dunleary Ratdown County Council this week, 70% of HAP tenants in Dunleary Ratdown are paying top-ups over and above their normal council rent contribution, 70%. Uh, thresholds say about 50% of HAP tenants are paying top-ups over and above their normal rent contribution, driving them directly into poverty. So, for example, Elaine and her four children, income €1,400 a month, is paying €350 top-up on top of 182 uh, council rent, leaving her with €900 for her and her four children uh, a month. And there are many more examples. So my question to you is this, uh, Taoiseach. Do you accept that your housing policies and their failure are directly driving families into poverty and Thank deprivation, you, and in particular, children? Will you commit now to abandoning the failed HAPS policy, but in the meantime guaranteeing that every HAPS tenant will not be forced to pay top-ups to, that drive them into poverty? Up, Deputy, will you raise the income thresholds for social housing support? And will you tell us where is the affordable housing? Because there is none. Thank you, Deputy Taoiseach. Yes, um, thanks very much, Deputy. There are lots of ways in which government is uh, helping people to buy their own homes. There's the Help to Buy scheme, which helps people to get a deposit, getting some of their taxes back. 10,000 people have availed of that. Uh, and that has helped them get a deposit to buy a new home. Uh, there's the Rebuilding Ireland Home Loan, which has helped thousands of people uh, to get mortgages. Uh, and in addition to that, there's all of the actions that government is taking to increase supply. Uh, 18,000 new homes built in Ireland last year. One in four of those were social housing, built by local authorities or affordable housing bodies. Probably the first time in a very long time that one in four homes built in Ireland uh, were public housing, uh, and we need to continue that now uh, and intensify it in the years ahead. Uh, the social housing income limit is under review. We acknowledge that it does need to be reviewed and increased uh, because of the fact that house prices have increased more rapidly than incomes, and that work is currently being done. Uh, but to come back to something you said earlier, uh, which isn't true, uh, were the figures that you uh, used in relation to poverty. Uh, and I think it was very misleading what you said, uh, because what you've done is you've included people who are in poverty and you've added to that the number of people who are at risk of poverty. Uh, and being at risk of poverty is not the same thing as being in poverty. 
Uh, being in poverty means having a low income, and as a result of that, um, suffering forms of deprivation. And that is a terrible thing and something we need to reduce and work on every year, uh, and every government does. Being at risk of poverty is a relative measure. It's related to earning 60% less than the median income. And you're a bright guy, you understand facts and you understand numbers. There will always be hundreds of thousands of people who earn less than 60% of the median income. So what you said was not true. You combined the at-risk of poverty figure with the poverty figure and said it was poverty. And that was misleading, uh, in my view, and you shouldn't do that type of thing. Uh, as far as poverty is concerned, and these are the CSO's figures and nobody disputes these, uh, poverty did, of course, rise during the recession, the financial crisis, but has now been falling for five years. Uh, in 2013, it peaked to 12.8%. It fell to 12.7 in 2014, fell to 11.5 in 2015, fell to 10.9 in 2016, fell to 8.8 in 2017, and we don't have the figures yet for 2018, uh, but we anticipate it has fallen again. So what we see is five years of falling levels of deprivation and falling levels of poverty. And the question you should be asking me, Deputy, is what policies has the government brought in to make that possible? How have we succeeded uh, in bringing down poverty and deprivation uh, for the past five years? That's the question you should have asked. And of course, the answer is simple. First of all, employment. Uh, if you're in employment, you have a 95 to 97.5% chance of not experiencing poverty. And we have worked so hard, and the Irish people have worked so hard, to turn this economy around uh, to make sure that we're approaching full employment. We've increased wages, the minimum wage up nearly 25% um, than it was uh, back in 2011 or 2012, and wages now going up across the economy. We've increased welfare for the last three budgets in a row uh, of all forms, um, weekly payments and also targeted payments, uh, such as those for uh, children in low-income families you, and the fuel ends. We're bringing in subsidised and affordable childcare. We're extending things like school meals. We're extending free GP care to more and more children. So, the question you should have asked is how have we managed to reduce poverty every Mind year for the past four years, and that's the answer to your question. When I need your help ask sure. formulating questions, I'll ask for it, uh, Taoiseach. I'll just quote from uh, the Social Justice Ireland report on this so-called uh, uh, incorrect facts. Approximately 230,000 children are living in poverty in Ireland today. That is one in five children under 18. The group you are referring to is the 110,000 who are living in consistent poverty. But there is 230,000 uh, living in poverty, a shameful one in five, but clearly you do not feel the shame. Uh, but you should. Uh, as for the, those working, it is also shameful. After children under 18, which form the biggest cohort of those living in poverty, the second biggest cohort, 14%, are people who are working. The working poor, the people who get up at seven in the morning uh, are working for a pittance and can't afford uh, the cost of putting a roof over uh, their head. And I asked you two specific questions. The first one, will you raise the income thresholds so that working people like that can get social housing support? You said it's under review. Taoiseach, it's been under re review for a year. Deputy, please. When are you going to actually raise the thresholds instead of, as is currently the case, culling people from the housing list and abandoning tens of thousands well, of others and failing to give them housing back, support? Deputy, and will you commit to end the practice where people are forced to pay top-ups uh, on HAP tenancies? Because if they pay those top-ups, they are driven by definition, by definition, they and their children are driven into poverty. Taoiseach. Deputy, I, I think you're easily one of the brightest and most intelligent members of this House. And for that reason, and for that reason Deputy, you should do better than to take your speaking lines from a press release uh, released by a campaign organisation or NGO of any sort. The official measure of poverty in Ireland is consistent poverty. You have added to that people at risk of poverty and created a, a definition of poverty that is not the one that is internationally accepted or the one used uh, in this state. At risk of poverty is a relative measure uh, related to the fact that there are people who earn 60% less than the median income. Unless everyone earns the same, and by the way it could be nothing, uh, there will always be people who earn 60% less than the median income. There will be always be a lot of people who earn less than 60% of the median income. 
Consistent poverty is the official poverty rate in Ireland, recognised broadly because it's low income plus two forms of deprivation. And that has been going down for four years now among adults and among children because of the policies of this government. Yes, I know we need to do more. But that wouldn't be happening if we weren't at least getting some things right. Thank you, Tisha. That completes leaders' questions. We move now, and I call on Deputy Tony McLaughlin to announce the order of business for the week.